Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Dr. Anthony Chafee, and I've, I've done a lot of research into diet, nutrition, how that effect, affects health and chronic disease. And tied into that is why aren't we taught all these things in school, in medical school, and in just grade school? And why are our nutritionists and other people telling us things that are actually making us sick since we've had all these very bright people with a lot of shiny letters after their name telling us all the things to do? Uh, we've gotten fatter and sicker than human beings have ever been in history. So why is that so? Um, I'm talking about the real healthcare crisis, um, causes and solutions. So I want to talk about what is going on. Why are people just getting sicker? Why is everything becoming more of a problem and what can we do about it? And also the, the system itself is not necessarily, the healthcare system is not necessarily, uh, to blame for that. And we'll talk about that. So, you know, where are we with human health today? How did we get here? What are the root causes that need addressing and how can we make the change? Okay, so starting with the first one. So when we look at, at, at human health from uh, multiple different uh, metrics, one of the things we can look at is non-communicable chronic diseases. These are the things, the so-called um, com- chronic diseases that are non-communicable. Like they're, I'm, I'm not gonna catch diabetes from someone. Someone's gonna catch lupus from another person. And yet we're seeing this more and more in people. There's just growing in abundance. We're seeing it in animals now. It's non-communicable. And when you feed animals the wrong thing, they get so-called human diseases. They get lupus, they get diabetes, they get cancer. Okay, but they're not catching it from us. They're eating the wrong thing. They're being poisoned by what they're eating. So these NCDs, the non-communicable chronic diseases, um, they're the cause, uh, the number one cause of uh, death and disability in the world. 74% of all deaths worldwide and 89% of all deaths in Australia. It's 90% in the rest of the Western world as well. So these are such things as cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, mental health, neurological conditions, uh, chronic kidney disease, so many others. And if you look at these numbers, sort of this breakdown, um, you'll see, you know, cardiovascular disease, cancers, all these sorts of things. Diabetes is is sort of lower, but I think diabetes affects all these other ones as well. And so you may die from something else, probably died with diabetes along with that. So if you look up here, there's the Eat Lancet study that showed, spoke about premature deaths across age groups from 1990 to 2017. The pink parts of these lines are the non-communicable diseases. So these are people that, that died prematurely. They weren't supposed to die. It wasn't their time. They died early for some reason, and these are the causes. And there's communicable uh, nutritional conditions. And, well, I think non-communicable disease are nutritional conditions, but the recognized, currently recognized nutritional deficiencies and um, genetic issues and then injuries. Very small amount on those, and they're they're very stable, right? But these non-communicable chronic diseases are massive, massive, massive killers, right? So it's a major burden of disease and it's only getting worse. So when we look at cardiovascular disease in particular, this is getting worse around the world. Um, the incidents have been increasing over the last century. The rates, the prevalence has gone up. If you look at the mortality rates of these from 2000, you see all the different cancers, ischemic heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, um, and so on. These are going up. These, uh, the mortality rates are going up, 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 up. And yet the acute respiratory infections, uh, perinatal diseases, HIV, AIDS, road traffic accidents, tuberculosis, malaria, all these things are actually staying pretty stable or coming down except for road traffic accidents. It seems to, you know, that, that just changes with, with, um, with the times. But everything else is staying very stable or coming down. 
except for the non-communicable chronic diseases. So obviously something's happening. Why is that? That's not genetic. It's not there's some sort of plague that's, that's spreading or something like that. So why is that going up? That's obviously something environmental, something that we can affect. We say, well, we don't know the causes of these things. So, well, we just treat the symptoms for it. Okay, well, that's fine if we don't know it, but we should be looking because obviously there is a cause. If it's not just genetic, it's not just, ah, it just happens. It is going up. It's going up. So something is influencing us and making us sicker. So non-communicable chronic disease are getting up in adolescence. So NCDs are going up in kids now. So we're getting uh, type 2 diabetes, used to be called adult onset diabetes until the 1990s. You had to get a bunch of 10-year-olds who were not adults uh, getting this, this form of diabetes. And they said, well, well, how can that be? Well, it was probably happening all the time. We just didn't notice it. And uh, we didn't have the screening methods for it. We just misdiagnosed it as type 1, then called juvenile diabetes. So they just renamed it type type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes and uh, just forgot about it. Now, you can do that once. You can say, well, maybe we just didn't notice this. You can do that once. Same with autism. It's, oh, we just probably weren't diagnosing it. Well, they tried that in the, 80, in the 90s, but then the rates went up in the 2000s and the 2010s and now the 2020s as well. So why is that? Is this we're just getting so much better? At, at recognizing the, the diabetes now? But no, of course not. So something is, is increasing this. Another issue that people don't seem to realize is that there is extremely low prevalence of cardiovascular disease before the 20th century. Now, people that are trying to mislead you will say, well, the age-adjusted rates of mortality for cardiovascular disease peaked in the 60s and 70s and then started coming down just right around the time we made these, these recommendations. Um, that's not what we said. We said the prevalence, the rates, the incidence, the amount of the percentage of people in the population that have cardiovascular disease is going up. The number of new diagnoses of cardiovascular disease is going up decade by decade. And around the world, mortality is definitely going up and it's outpacing the, uh, the, the rate of growth in the population as well. So that's just talking about in America, deaths have calmed down, but we have better access to medicine. We have better interventions. Uh, people are smoking less. In the, in the early 1900s, in the 1800s, four out of five men smoked, right? And so we are smoking less. All these things are going to have, have an effect, but the rate is going up. Well, that's just screening. No, the amount of people having their first heart attack is going up decade after decade. It's just they're surviving. So you look at mortality rates, that doesn't tell you the whole picture. And when you go back far enough, you'll see it's a very different picture indeed, because the first diagnosed death from heart attack, from myocardial infarction in America was in 1912. That was the first recorded death from heart attack proven on autopsy. There wasn't a single case before that. Now there were cases of atherosclerosis. They noticed, little, oh, look at this, there's this little plaque or something built up in there, and they recognize that as abnormal. Look at Gray's anatomy, these things, you have these anatomical uh, depictions of all the layers of the art artery walls going back hundreds of years. And that was at, that's, that's normal to have no plaque there. So they recognize, look at this, this is abnormal, that's strange. We saw that, they didn't see heart attacks. There's a couple in the literature in Europe. There's one I found in the 1700s. There's a couple in the 1800s. There is zero in America before 1912. And then 10 years after that, and this is at a time when four out of five men smoked, remember. 20 years later, it's the number one killer in America. So what happened there? Well, it's just, well, I guess we're just not diagnosing it. Nonsense. If you look at, if you look at uh, medical textbooks from the 1800s, which I have, I have my great-grandfather's a uh, medical textbook from Sir William Osler. It is exquisitely detailed of all the different sort of anatomical issues and problems of the body and the heart. When you when you have a myocardial infarction, a serious one, it's, this is not a subtle sign. You have a huge piece of damage to that cardiac uh, tissue and it dies, it scars down. That's not a subtle sign to miss. And the way you die from that is either you get an arrhythmia because you have this big, massive scar and the electricity can't propagate properly. And so you get, you get a, 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 an arrest, right? And so you would know that, notice that big scar or the damaged heart muscle ruptures and you die of a, of a cardiac tamponade, 
right? So you're not going to miss a giant just ripping, ripped out wall of the heart. And like, oh, I guess we just didn't see it. Like nonsense. You know, we were looking at these things for hundreds of years. You know, so um, was it, you know, Harvey, Dr. Harvey, he described the circulatory system something like 500 years ago. They, they took thousands of autopsies and looked at these things very closely. These were not dumb people. In fact, they were doing a lot more with a lot less. Now, the other argument is, well, people just weren't living long enough to develop heart disease. Also nonsense. If you look at the census data, it goes back to 1850 in America. They didn't just say average life expectancy from birth, because that's what we use now. It's you know, 78 in America or you know, similar ages in other Western countries. That's, that's average life expectancy from birth. That's very different to how old do people, how long do people live if they die of old age? Very different, right? And so back in the 1850s, infant mortality rate was very high. It could be as high as three out of five, right? So the other two people actually had to live a long time. There were wars and famines and other sorts of horrible things. So the people looking at this census data were a lot smarter than the people making that argument because they looked at from birth and then every decade, 10 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 80. So in the 1850s, they were saying, if you made it to 80 years old, how much longer would you live? If everyone was dying in their 30s, why, why do you need to keep that statistic? There wouldn't be any statistics to keep. And in fact, when you got into adulthood, if you made it to zero, if you were from birth in 1850, sure, the average life expectancy was 38. But again, that's average. If you made it to 10 years old, it was 58. It's a big jump right? There's a lot of people having heart attacks in their 30s too. So that wouldn't have held it back even if we were dying at, at 38. Another good little, little mental experiment. Does anybody here know what the required minimum age is to run for president of the United States? Anyone know? It's 35, right? When did they come up with that rule? In the 1770s, right? And so they said, no, you're too young at 35, or 34, now at 35, you can do that. All the founding fathers lived uh, of America, you know, John Adams and, and uh, Jefferson and all these people, they lived until their 80s and 90s. Adams was 91. He was born in the mid-1700s, right? So no, people absolutely lived you know, well and truly long enough to develop these diseases. This is a new disease, right? Mean consumption was also the lowest they had been in 200 years in American history in the 1920s and 30s when this became the number one killer in America. We were eating more meat in the 1800s when there were zero heart attacks in the 1700s and the 16 and 1500s when we were having zero recorded heart attacks and deaths. So it's not even associated with meat, but it is associated with the rise in processed foods in seed oils, in sugars, and all of these things that we're being told and told and told are really, really good for us. Okay, so what about brain health? Alzheimer's disease was again one of these diseases that did not exist before the 20th century. It was presented by Dr. Alzheimer's as a single case report of a, a woman with um, uh, Alzheimer's dementia. And this was a single case, and there wasn't a single piece of evidence in the literature prior to this describing the same pathology of what we call now Alzheimer's dementia. It didn't make a big hit at the conference. People were just going, oh, whatever. It's just a case report. It's just one off. We've never seen this before. We don't care. There was one person who was quite influential who uh, wrote uh, a book on neurology and neurological pathologies, and he included that in there and called it Alzheimer's dementia. 1906. Well, we already established that people were living into their 80s and 90s. Why weren't they getting this? When I was taught in medical school was that if you live long enough, everyone will get Alzheimer's. Do we see that in any animal population in the world? No. You have animals in the wild. Okay, well, they get killed by something. Sure. What about animals in the zoo? They're not, they don't see like the old lion just like staggering around, limping and drooling. You know, you just don't see that. You don't see them getting osteoporosis. You don't see them getting arthritis unless they're being fed irresponsibly and treated inappropriately. And, uh, and, they, and people get arrested for animal abuse and things like that. Well, why the hell aren't we getting arrested for, for feeding ourselves this same nonsense that abuses our own bodies as well? So the mortality rate for Alzheimer's is just going up as well. So this is again becoming more prevalent. Now it was non-existent a hundred or so years ago, but now it's just kill, still going up and still going up. Oh, well, maybe we just didn't, maybe we just didn't diagnose it. Like, okay, okay. again, 
you can say that once, you know, but once you start paying attention, clock starts and then we see if you're right or not. And I'm sorry, but like, why wouldn't you notice someone with advanced dementia that can't function as a, as a normal, healthy, ind independent adult anymore? Of course you notice that. And a hundred years ago, this did not happen. 50 years ago, we did not have the same amount of, of elderly care facilities and nursing homes that we do now. And now it's big, big business. Uh, it did not used to be. People used to die at home. My great grandfather, whose medical textbook I have, was born in 1875. He died in 1975 at home, fully compass mentis and independent. You know, that was normal, right? Now it's abnormal. Now people are getting earlier and earlier signs of dementia and they're getting um, more and more cognitive delay and impairment. And as you can see here, this um, mortality rate for Alzheimer's is going up. And that's, and that's in spite of age adjusting it to try to lower it, it's still going up. So as you can see here, it's, it's, it's coming up quite dramatically in total and it's expected to just get higher and higher and higher. Why are we expecting this to get worse? Well, that's the trend. Why would it be getting worse? What's happening? Are we just living longer? No, actually the, the life expectancy has actually gone down in recent years. So that's not, it's not we're living longer and that's why we're getting more dementia. We're getting more dementia at earlier ages, right? So these are earlier, younger ages, right? So it's still creeping up even for those um, in earlier ages as well. Hey everyone, really happy to announce a new sponsor for the show and for everybody down in Australia, Stockman Steaks, who are delivering high quality grass fed and finished pasture raised beef and other meats, flash frozen and vacuum sealed to your door. Something that I've been enjoying a lot of myself recently as well. They also have a great range of specialty items such as high fat keto mints and carnivore beef and organs mints with liver, kidneys and beef heart as well. So use code CHAFEE today for a free order of beef mints or another specialty gift along with your order at stockmanstakes.com.au and I'll see you over there. Thanks guys. What about reproductive health? Well, we have some of the worst reproductive um, numbers that we've had in, uh, in recorded history. Now, some of this is going to be choice in different Western countries, but the amount of people that are trying to get pregnant aren't able to and going through IVF sort of treatments and other sorts of fertility treatments is going up. And we look at hormonal health, and obviously this is tied up with that as well. We have the testosterone levels in men is the lowest in recorded history. There was an article, um, as you can see here, Called, uh, they said, you're not half the man your grandfather was. And that was from the early 2000s where they, they recorded and, and uh, measured the testosterone levels of men in their 20s and compared them to men in their 60s from the 1970s. And they found that the men in, in their 60s in the 1970s had twice the level of testosterone of 20-something-year-old 20 20 year old men in the 2000s. So they said, you're not half the man your grandfather was. And you can see here as well, you see this, this, this massive decline in testosterone levels as well. But what about women? Fertility rates are going down significantly. Uh, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is now being called type 4 diabetes. Alzheimer's is being called type 3 diabetes. That's because you know, your brain is not getting an appropriate amount of glucose. And you get insulin resistance of, you know, again, your brain is part of your body, just as we've sort of reiterated here uh, several times today in talks. And so because it's part of your body, you can get insulin resistance for your brain as well as the rest of your body. And we actually see this on, on PET CTs. We actually see that there's lower uptake of glucose in the brain on PET CT on, with people with Alzheimer's. Right, And so what's happening is over the years, you're getting less and less energy in, your brain is just decaying and atrophying, amongst other sorts of things as well, I think are contributory. When you switch over to a ketogenic diet and your ketones go up, that doesn't require insulin, that bypasses that process, goes directly into your brain, it lights up. Because two thirds of your brain, including your cortex, primarily run on ketones. Why do I say that when everybody says, oh, you have to have a certain amount of glucose? Well, first of all, when you're in ketosis, you make glucose. So problem solved. But uh, in fact, two thirds of your brain prefer ketones because when you have an adequate amount of ketones and you have an adequate amount of glucose, those parts of your brain will only run on the ketones. So even though you have an abundance of, of glucose, just puts it to the side. So that's preference. It's only when those ketones start coming down that you start replacing that with glucose. So that's a preference. That's its primary energy source. And then ketones cross the blood brain barrier. This is especially important for kids because, and elderly um, adults because your brain 
requires fat to grow and rebuild and repair itself and ketones cross the blood brain barrier and reconstitute into fatty acids and that is used as the physical matrix of your brain so type 3 diabetes being alzheimer's type 4 diabetes being pcos polycystic ovarian syndrome which is the leading cause of female driven infertility and this is largely again because of our friend insulin you eat carbohydrates insulin goes up Insulin controls about 100 different, actually more than 100 different mechanisms in your body besides glucose control. And so when you have it at a, at a nice normal level, um, when you're fasting or just not eating carbohydrates, it's affecting everything at that nice low level. Call it a five. You eat a pa pasta or bread or something like that, jumps up to a 35. Now you're, uh, now you're affecting everything at a 35. So everything is way out of balance. And one of them is your hormones because... PCOS can be caused by insulin resistance. That's why it's called type 4 diabetes. Insulin blocks the, the, the conversion of testosterone into estrogen. Women make testosterone first, and then that's converted into estrogen in the ovaries. So insulin blocks that. So you get too much testosterone and not enough estrogen, and you get PCOS. And you can put on weight, you can get facial hair, body hair, things like that, other sorts of things that you see in two with too much testosterone. And then you're infertile and you don't get uh, your cycles properly, just like you'd see with someone with insufficient amount of estrogen. And that, that accounts for nearly 40% of the, of the infertility issues. And you have uterine factors, things like uterine fibroids, those are also um, largely uh, caused by insulin resistance. People that go on ketogenic diets actually find they have shrinkage of their fibroids uh, quite consistently. So that seems to be influenced by insulin as well. So what about diabetes? So this is a growing problem. And this, this, unfortunately, these statistics only go to 2006 was sort of the best graphic. Yeah, but you see this massive spike you know, since it's sort of slowly creeping up, slowly creeping up, then you hit the 80s and 90s and it really starts going up, right? What happened around that time? We started telling everybody that fat was bad, meat was bad. Okay, stop eating that. What do you replace it with? Carbs, carbs and sugar, and then seed oils because you want the polyunsaturated fats, the unsaturated fats. Well, those ones are great for you. Okay, well, um, it's you have a massive spike in, in, in diabetes at that time. It's increased by a, a roughly a factor of eight since the 1980s. And it accounts for 9% uh, of the population in the U.S., is estimated to have type 2 diabetes, and that accounts for 75% of the Medicare budget. So it's a very expensive disease to treat, and it causes other diseases as well. 40% of America um, is estimated to be pre-diabetic. So ostensibly, if you don't do anything, and why would they, in 10 years or so, you could have as much as 50% of the U.S. population or the world population, because there's similar statistics around the West, could uh, have... Uh, type 2 diabetes. What the hell is that going to do to the healthcare budget, right? So we're talking about what about our healthcare system? Do we go public? Do we go private? It's like that's just rearranging chair, deck chairs on the Titanic, right? It's like that's not the problem. The problem is this massive, massive growth of burden of disease. That's going to sink any ship. It doesn't matter what system you have. It's going to destroy it. And it's only getting worse, right? So this is looking at, this is from the Harvard School of Public Health, and they estimated a lot of the costs that we get from these non-communicable chronic diseases, only five of them, right? So, so those five, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, COPD, diabetes, mental illness. So just those five, not even autoimmunity, which is very expensive to treat, and a lot of other diseases, just those five. And you can see from 2010 that this is increasing, nearly doubling in the billions and then getting into the trillions in these sorts of diseases um, from 2010 to 2030. So this is getting more expensive. This is getting more prevalent. This is causing a huge burden, but then it gets even more exciting. So the direct costs, right? So the costs that we pay for hospitals and medicine and these sorts of things, estimated to be over $13 trillion worldwide by 2030. But then these are some of the opportunity costs, the indirect costs, right? So you, people are sick, they're missing out on work, they're getting on disability, they're not you know, functioning in society and that costs society. The, the lost opportunity cost was estimated to be about $47 trillion between 2011 and 2030. 
right? So it keeps piling up. And then just the economic burden of life lost due to these NCDs ranges from $22 trillion in 2010, estimated to go up to $43 trillion by 2030. So we're paying trillions of dollars for this processed garbage food. And then we're paying over $13 trillion a year just to treat the effects of that processed garbage food. But then we're losing you know, upwards of 40, 50 trillion dollars a year because of the lost opportunity causes, uh, costs and excess deaths. So this is a very expensive endeavor. That's a very expensive bowl of cornflakes. So how do we get here? Um, well, it's complicated. I think all of you probably guessed a lot of these things, but um, sugar and processed foods, seed oils, um, alcohol, pollution, all these, all these things contribute. Um, but in, in Western countries, especially as we've become more advanced, we've actually reduced pollution significantly. We have more developing countries have absolutely appalling um, air quality. When I was when I was doing humanitarian work in Bangladesh, the, I mean, I, no, they didn't have garbage disposals. They just had to burn everything. But because these same monsters were getting their processed food garbage into their into their, uh, I mean, in the middle of, of a village, in the middle of a jungle, I don't even know how. They, it's actually impressive they, they get these things out there. But I, I would see grass huts with banana leaves on top. And they'd have bags of ruffle chips, like fun size packs of ruffle chips and, and gummy bears and things like that. It's absolutely insane. Um, and so they had all this plastic waste that didn't biodegrade, didn't go away, couldn't throw it away because they didn't have any garbage disposal. They just swept it up into a pile and they burned it. It's just black inky smoke coming up. And that was just what the, the, the sky and atmosphere looked like. It was just constant black inky smoke and debris. Um, so that's affecting part of the world, but not necessarily us. And again, four out of five people smoked in the early 20th century. Now it's much less. It's much, much less. So we can't blame that entirely. Something else is causing this as well. We look at sugar consumption, that's gone right up. And I, I don't have the graph here, but you, there's a very similar graph with seed oils. And it just comes right up from the late 1800s. So starting about here and then just going up, they both perfectly track with cardiovascular disease and the rise of chronic diseases, right? So it's not saying that there's a cause and effect relationship there, but there is a strong association where there is zero association with animal fat and meat because you just go back before the 20th century or even to the early 20th, early 20th century, you're completely, it's completely disassociated, right? We see this, this consumption, all these different countries with massively increased sugar, and then the the orange areas, high fructose corn syrup. It's the same thing. You know, it's, it's it's a mixture of fructose and glucose. Whereas sugar, table sugar, is just sucrose, and that's a disaccharide of, of an exactly 50-50 mix of glucose and fructose. It's the same thing. High fructose corn syrup is like fifty four percent fructose and and forty six percent glucose. So it's very very similar. So you know that's another scapegoat that Coca-Cola and others have tried to paint the blame. Oh, if only we knew. We had no idea how bad high fructose corn syrup was. Oh, if only we knew, we would just stick with normal sugar. It's the same thing. It's just it's just a sacrificial lamb so that they can keep on selling their drugs to people. And that's what they are. They are drug dealers. And they're trying to hook kids early. Just like any good drug dealer, you hook them early, you have a, a, a customer for life. So as as Natalie said, and sorry, there's, there's a typo here, but you know we spend about... $1.3 trillion a year on sugar, and we spend $2.4 trillion a year uh, treating the effects of sugar. And that's just sugar. And remember, we're spending $13 plus trillion dollars a year on, on everything total, and then all, all the opportunity costs and the live loss cost is a massive, massive, massive cost, all for a couple trillion dollars in, in uh, sales. It's not even profits. So the, the profits from, from the sugar company is $400 billion. Right, so out of that 1.3 trillion, out of that 3.7 trillion in treating sugar and selling sugar, they get 400 billion out of that, and then we have all the opportunity costs and lives lost and things like that on top of it. It's really, it's really, it's really uh, not a great return on investment, especially when you're talking about the lives lost and people getting hurt. 
So as we were saying, you know, heavy corporate influences that have that have pushed the scale in one direction. Um, Kellogg's cereal was founded in, in the the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century, by Dr. Kellogg, who was a Seventh Day Adventist church member. I did a whole talk on this on the Last Regenerate conference that people may have seen. People can look up online called the corruption of our medical and nutritional guidelines. But suffice it to say that they have a religious bent on getting rid of meat. They think that it's sinful. And it causes lust and lust is a sin and therefore meat is a sin. So we should all stop that. And that's, you know, their want, whatever they want to believe is fine, but they're trying to force this on everybody else. And so Kellogg's was of this opinion and he started making meat alternatives like Kellogg's cornflakes and other sort of nut meat sort of uh, alternatives as well to sort of replace meat as well. And he wasn't hiding this. He, he said, this is in order to reduce your your lustful desires and things like that. He was, he was very clear about that. And then this sort of thing took, took a life of its own and this big processed food empire has grown out because of that. But that's where it started. Sanitarium Foods here in Australia, it's still owned by the Seventh-day Adventist church. They've never paid taxes. They have tax exempt status. And the problem is, is that they make trillions as we discussed, uh, maybe not every year, but they're, you know, they're multi-billion dollar enterprise. And, now they're in control of the narrative because they're they're pumping out tons and tons of money, pushing that narrative about plant-based food being the best, meat being bad. Well, that supports two two of their posts, which is their religious ideology and also now their their financial investments and ties. So that's not what you want. You don't want people that are that are pushing out their agenda on people because of their own ideologies or their 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 own financial motives. Um, the big problem with that is that they didn't invade and buy off the nutritional academies. They invented them. They founded them. There's a Seventh-day Adventist church member named Lena Cooper, L-E-E-N-A Cooper. And she was she was all about plant-based. She founded the American Nutritional and Dietetics Association. And she wrote the first textbook taught in university courses in nutrition. It's, it, as far as I know, it's still in print. And its current iteration, its current edition, is still being taught in Ivy League schools in America. Sally Norton said that one of her textbooks at Cornell University was that book. I think it was the 44th edition. And so they didn't just invade this, the institutions. They are the institutions. You know, we talk about the man behind the curtain. They're like three curtains back. Right, so that's a problem. They're also pumping out the majority of the research. Right, so all the evidence on nutrition, nutritional research, it's largely funded by industry. Coca Cola alone spends eleven times the amount of money on nutritional research than the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. Right, so this is a the mass majority of studies coming out in nutrition specifically comes from the exact people that we should never listen to, the people with an agenda who want to want to sell a product or push uh, an ideology on us. So you have to be very careful. You know, this is, you know, uh, people talk about, about, you know, oh, where's the study? Where's the study? Where's the study? That's not science. That's academia. That's just publishing things for the sake, sake of publishing things. You know, science is observation and looking what happens in the real world situations and then designing studies to try to extrapolate more meaning out of that. But if you have a study that tells you that rocks fly and you throw a rock and it falls, like, I don't care what your study says. Like, it's just the observed fact is that you're wrong. And when I, as a doctor and a clinician, I go against those guidelines and do something else and I see the exact opposite results of what someone says, I'm going to trust my real world experiences and what happens to my actual patients in, in the real world than any study. Um, and, and now we know why, because this isn't even academia at this point. This is just marketing. You know, these studies are not someone publishing this because they think, wow, look, I, I found this out. This is, this is a directed, targeted approach to sell a product and push an ideology. They're not the only ones. There's a big profit motivation in this. Obviously, the drug companies make a lot. These investment companies make a lot. Goldman Sachs had a, a slide leaked from one of their, one of their meetings that said, is curing patients a sustainable business model? The answer of that, of course, is no, because if you just cure someone, then, then the problem's gone. You give them medicine once and that's it. The, just again, going back to the drug dealer uh, metaphor, 
the money is on the return, the return customer. You get them addicted and now they're dependent and they have to keep coming back, keep coming back. Who is more dependent? Someone who does cocaine or someone who requires uh, blood pressure medication and and something to keep down their rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's and gout and all these sorts of things. They're, they are beholden to these drug companies or else they will get very sick. They're not even having fun with it. They're just not dying, right? So, you know, it's... <laughs> It's a pretty, pretty horrible sort of uh, drug dealer relationship, if you ask me. But um, so they're they're not they're not interested in curing disease. That's what doctors used to be about: was curing disease, getting people better. We did that. The last thing we cured was polio, right? And they're still mad about all the money they lost on polio. They don't cure anything now, right? It's just about the treatment, just treating symptoms, and that's it. And they go, well, we just don't know what's causing it. That's because you're not looking for it. So it's a product development market. And they're not going to look for a product that will just run itself out, right? It's like planned obsolescence in cars. They used to make cars that just last forever, decades, decades and decades. Now they don't. They just they are designed to break down so that you have to you get scheduled repair and maintenance and that you have to replace your car, right? Uh, it's the same with medicine now too. They're trying to just keep you coming back for more. So we just need to know that, right? That's fine. That's their motivation. Our motivation is being well and healthy. So we don't look to them for cures. We look at other means for cures, right? So we, we do our own research and look into this. And of course, oh, don't do your own research. Just listen to experts. There's one of the oldest sayings in the world is you keep people ignorant, you keep them under control. So don't listen to anybody that, does this, that says don't do your own research. That's called being educated right? That's called looking things up and reading books, right? So anybody who tells you not to do that is, is clearly not your friend. Um, there was even a, a whistleblower that came out and he worked in big pharma and he said that there was one of these executives from the pharmaceutical companies that said, uh, asked a rhetorical question, well, you know what my favorite drug is that, that our company makes? And you know, you'd hope they'd say something like something that, you know, cures childhood leukemia or something like that. And he said, no, my favorite drug that our company makes or any drugs that have side effects that we have other drugs that treat. Because that's how their heads work. They just want money. They don't care about your suffering. In fact, they're happy for you to suffer more so that they can sell you more drugs. So you're sick people. So the editor of uh, the Lancet Journal, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, is a guy named uh, Dr. Horton, Richard Horton. Um, he, he, he made a, a whole big statement. He's not the only one. The, the editor-in-chief of uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, also probably the most prestigious medical journal in history, um, they both came out and said that, that basically medical research is unreliable at best or completely fraudulent. And they said at least half falls into this category. And that's because uh, big pharmacy and big food, they falsify and manipulate tests um, in order to get the result that they want to push their product and say that it's not only safe, but good for you. And this was reiterated by uh, many, many, many other editors and scientists of, of notes like John Ioannidis from Stanford, who's one of the most cited researchers of all time. And, uh, and he said that these, that these studies are basically garbage and you just cannot trust them because again, even if they were just honestly done, that's still academia. That's not science, but they're not even that. This is this is marketing and propaganda at this point. That's the vast majority of this stuff. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, the Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work, and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. So... We need to get back to treating what healthcare was designed for. You know, it used to be that we had very specific things um, that um, that we used to treat before the rise of the non-communicable diseases, and those were things like injuries, pregnancy and childbirth, congenital and genetic disorders, which 
much, much lower. There's very rare infectious diseases that accounted for a lot more. And uh, malnutrition, people not getting enough to eat, um, different sorts of vitamin deficiencies, pellagra, beriberi, these sorts of things. Uh, and then toxicities and poisonings, you get exposed to lead. People got sick for that for centuries before they figured out what the hell that was. Or poison scorpions or snake bites or these sorts of things, right? Now we're dealing with these NCDs. And that, again, accounts for 90% of what we see as doctors on a day-to-day -day basis and 90% of the deaths in the Western world. But that's actually just these last two. It's malnutrition and toxicity. We're not getting proper nutrition. We're not getting the, the nutrients that we require for our brain and our body and our proper development. You know, uh, Jalal spoke about the misdevelopment of the jaws and teeth. We saw that immediately after agriculture, everywhere we went, when people went from predominantly meat to predominantly plants, the height and health of populations declined every single time. Brains decreased by 11% for adult men, 17% uh, for adult women. Jaws became smaller, teeth became more crowded and crooked, and we started having all these sort of dent uh, dentition issues, signs of, of poor wound healing, of uh, malnourishment, as well as tuberculosis in the spines and bones of these skeletons that, that did not happen before agriculture immediately after they found that. And so, and then toxicities, this toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet, eating things that have no business being in our body. And I would include every, every and all plants in that, right? To, 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 you know, to different degrees, right? But there are toxins in plants and we don't have as, as good of defenses against them as other animals do. But even those other animals that only eat plants, they only eat very specific plants because they have defense, defenses for those plants. And so you don't see animals eating outside of their biological design and staying healthy. And so if an animal eats a certain plant, it needs to just eat those plants. If it eats outside of that, it can get very sick. And in veterinary medicine, we have a lot of diseases named for this. Big head, big tongue, limp neck, crazy cow syndrome. Those are all diseases, but they all, they all are named for diseases of, of a, a toxicity. The animal, the cow, it, it eats a plant that it's not supposed to eat. Normally, you don't see this in the wild. Uh, because you know, they just keep walking. They don't just eat any random thing. But if you're stuck in a pasture and you sort of run out of food because you're you know, out of neglect or something like that, then, then they might eat plants that they normally wouldn't and they get these issues and sicknesses and diseases, right? So we know that in the animal population. We know that a malnourishment um, disease that happens in cows is muscular dystrophy. Cows get muscular dystrophy and it's the exact same disease as human muscular dystrophy from what I understand. But they have figured out that it's actually a selenium deficiency. And so you give these cows selenium and it goes away or it just never happens in the first place, right? Has anyone ever asked if our muscular dystrophy in our children is from a deficiency like from selenium or, or anything else? I would, I, would, you know, I would try to encourage and challenge anybody here that deals with muscular dystrophy or anybody you know, watching this recording who, who treats muscular dystrophy or children in general uh, to ask that question and maybe check their selenium, check other, other sorts of nutrients. Um, we also know that we're getting malnourished because our reference ranges are getting lower and lower and lower for all these different um, nutrients. So people think you go to your doctor and they check your B12 or your folate or, or something like that. And they say, okay, well, it's in this range. That's good, right? Oh, no, now it's too high. That's bad. It's too low. Oh, that's bad right? Why is that? Because they're saying that that reference range is the optimal range for optimal health. But that's not what that range is. That range is the average for the community. And that's why every single lab has different reference ranges all over the world. That's because they have a different reference range population. So we need to look at the actual ranges for good health. And those are very different. And so you will actually see, I see if <laughs> this would revolutionize medicine overnight. If you just actually use reference ranges that actually denoted actual health and doctors would see just the whole, you know, several pages of just red numbers. Like, oh my, oh my God, you know, they, you'd have to do something right now. Now they're looking, oh no, no, everything's fine. No, you're fine. Uh, they're not fine. They're malnourished. They have low testosterone. They have low estrogen. They have other sorts of dyscrasias and that they're just not being picked up because everyone is getting it. And so those reference ranges are changing. But if you look at actual health, 
You'll see this very clearly. So we're getting malnourished and we're getting poisoned. And I think that's, uh, that's the, the beginning and end of most of these chronic diseases. So some of these things, you know, we talk about root cause issues. A lot of this stuff comes from stress, processed food, sugar, lack of sleep, processed carbs, sedentary lifestyle, seed oil, things like that. And this can all lead to insulin resistance. And they get all these little things coming off. Migraines, PCOS, inflammation, heart disease, erectile dysfunction, type 2 diabetes, all these sorts of things. And uh, it, it's not on here, but you, you, would, you could also argue that things like cancer will be on there too. And I've uh, I've, I've sort of started calling cancer type five diabetes, heard it here first, right? Um, and that's because your body gets disrupted and it can't function properly. If you, if you understand the cancer biology mechanisms and the molecular um, mitochondrial, or the, the, the role that mitochondria have to play in cancer, um, you understand that the, the, every cancer cell has damaged mitochondria, but they don't necessarily have damaged DNA. In fact, some cancers don't have any genetic dis, uh, changes, but they all have mitochondrial dysfunction. One thing you get when you raise insulin, one of those over 100 things that you disrupt is autophagy, something that people have heard. It's just autophagy. The body is eating parts of itself. Some people argue that, well, that comes from uh, you, your body's starving and it's trying to scavenge resources. Well, that doesn't make sense. We have a lot of fat. We have a lot of stored energy, so we don't actually need that. Um, and it's actually a normal process. You take a mitochondria, you break it down for parts, and then you make more mitochondria. So that's not actually taking that and then using it somewhere else. They're just replacing it. That's normal housekeeping. That's normal repair of, of the cell and the cellular structures. And so on ketogenic diets, you don't have to fast to get autophagy. Just being in ketosis allows you to go through autophagy. And we see in, in studies that after several months on a ketogenic diet, that you have four times the number of mitochondria and they're four times as effective, right? So you're going through that autophagy phase. And so if you're keeping your mitochondria healthy, there's a lot of things that can damage mitochondria. Um, but if you're able to repair them and replace them before they get so damaged that they cause dysfunction and disease, well, then you're on the right track and that could potentially keep you safe from developing cancer in the first place if you're able to keep your insulin low and go through autophagy. So um, insulin resistance itself is actually uh, a major issue for cardiovascular disease. So heart disease risk increases by sixfold with people with metabolic syndrome, by tenfold with people with diabetes. So that's a big risk factor that's up there with smoking. That all comes from the same origin, insulin resistance. We have thousands of studies showing that ketogenic metabolic therapy using a ketogenic diet, like a carnivore diet, because carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet, just a more strict ketogenic diet, that this, is, this used therapeutically to treat diseases has amazing effects, has better effects than, than most uh, medications for many of these diseases. It's been shown to reverse diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and to significantly uh, reduce the need for medications like insulin for type 1 diabetes, keep their blood sugar in much, much better control, and, and many other things, autoimmune diseases, Alzheimer's, things like that. It shows big improvement. And, uh, and as we said, that this is, this is very important for, for our children um, and, uh, and, and adults as well because of the ketones actually make the brain run better and cross over and reconstitute into fatty acids and help build the structures of your brain. So it's very important. It's, it's, it's our primary metabolic state. That's the primary metabolic state of nearly all animals in the wild, carnivores and herbivores. 70% of animal species are carnivores and they just eat fat and protein from animals. Right? They don't get carbs, so they're in that ketogenic starvation state. It's not a starvation state. That's a normal, typical state of life. Herbivores, they eat a whole bunch of grass and fiber and things like that. Oh, well, that's carbohydrates. That's glucose. But they don't break down the glucose. There's no animal that has cellulase, which is the enzyme required to break down cellulose. Even termites can't do it. It's the, it's the microbes in their gut that can do that. And the microbes eat the fiber. And as a result, as a byproduct, they produce saturated fat. And then the microbes die off and they absorb that as protein. So they eat fiber, but what they absorb is fat and protein, just like we need to do as well, except we can't turn fiber into that because we haven't been eating 
fiber. Uh, we're not designed to eat fiber. Okay, so they're all in that ketogenic state as well. And that's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear also. So another thing that, that insulin does is it, it is the fat storage hormone. This is a young girl with type 1 diabetes. And you can see here, she doesn't have insulin. She can't, cannot put on uh, any sort of fat or muscle tissue. You need insulin uh, to put on muscle as well. And so her body just wastes away and she'd die if she didn't get insulin. Now she's given insulin, she's just a normal little girl. Too much insulin can go the other way. So people with an insulinoma, an insulin secreting tumor, they get extremely obese. It doesn't matter what they eat. Everything that goes into their mouth is just stored into fat very quickly. And their, their metabolism and these other sorts of processes that insulin affects are massively deranged. So they have a lot of comorbidities as a result of that as well. And this affects all sorts of other um, satiety pathways, such as leptin causing overeating on top of that. Anything you eat is going to go into fat and you're just being told, eat, 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 eat. And you can't even access this anyway because insulin blocks the mobilization of energy from your fat stores as well. Okay, so how do we address this? Well, there is a cause that has this effect. And so you have to identify what that cause is. And when we do, when we remove certain foods and blood sugar lowers and insulin comes down and these diseases start to reverse, and then you remove other things as well because people can be on a ketogenic diet or a very clean omnivorous diet and they still get autoimmune diseases and they still get rashes and they still get migraines and they still get all sorts of different things and then they cut out all the rest of it and just go back to what we've been eating historically as as human beings as a population prior to the agricultural revolution or native australians native americans 120 years ago these diseases go away and in fact they didn't have those diseases in the 1800s in these populations in any great number because they weren't eating the same things but when they switched over to a western diet they started getting the western diseases that's what they were called the diseases of the west because the the different populations around like the native americans and native australians they weren't getting these diseases they oh it's only europeans that are getting these sorts of things well now they're getting them and they're getting them in spades. When I first came to Australia, I was told day one that if you get an Aboriginal patient, Native Australian, that whatever their age says on their file, you add 20 years to that because they just die faster. They just break down faster. They get these diseases faster. So if you see a patient in their 30s, you have to treat them as their geriatric patient. That's because their bodies are just breaking down faster. And I have a patient who works with the, the native population. And she said, this, this is actually something they know about when you live in the city for a while, people just get sick, they get these city diseases. And so the treatment for that is they just not, not checking into the hospital. I'm going out, I'm going out into the bush and living with my family out there. And they just live out, they just go back to nature, just do what they've been doing for really the entire existence of humanity. Diseases just go away. I mean, sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the, something, the progression is too far gone and you won't make it, but they do this for a lot of different sorts of issues. And we're doing this now in clinical practice as well. And again, we saw thousands of these things. So we're seeing, um, not just examples. These aren't just, we're seeing, we're seeing large scale human trials with ketogenic diets. And what is a ketogenic diet? It just means you get rid of carbohydrates. Okay. What do you replace it with? Well, just like you got rid of meat, what do you replace it with? Carbohydrates. When you get rid of carbohydrates, you replace it with meat, really. You replace it with protein and fat. But the sources for that protein and fat is largely from animal products. You could do this with a vegetarian diet, but it'd be difficult. You basically have to drink canola oil and take a bunch of multivitamins. And so it's not really practical and no one really wants to do it. So they don't. All of these studies don't use a plant-based ketogenic diet. They use an animal-based ketogenic diet. And that's what's really important to know and understand because people will say, well, there's no evidence for a meat-based diet. No, no, that's the only diet that has evidence because it's the only diet that's been studied rigorously. Plant-based diets are just survey questionnaires. They ask a bunch of nurses and say, hey, what'd you eat last year? That's actually a study. That's the nurse's study. And they ask them once a year what they ate last year. They don't say, hey, keep track this year. They say, hey, what'd you eat last year? Good luck getting accurate information. The only ones that have been studied rigorously are an animal-based diet. So that actually is the safest diet. It's actually the most beneficial diet. And people are saying that we shouldn't call this a diet. We should call this a therapeutic intervention because it is, because we're, we're reversing diseases. And that's because we're removing the cause. There's a cause and effect relationship. When you remove something and the effect goes away, 
That should make you think. When you bring that something back and the effect comes back, then you're really onto something and that cause and effect relationship. So again, diabetes was, was shown to be reversible with a low carb ketogenic diet, animal based at Verda Health. Um, Dr. Unwin and others have been reversing numerous cases of diabetes. Dr. Unwin has been keeping count and keeping records and showing that uh, he's a UK doctor and he's showing the NHS, hey, this is how many tens of thousands of pounds I'm saving you every year just on diabetes medications, all these other diabetes uh, medications. That's probably the only reason he hasn't been struck off yet for going against the, the guidelines. But he has to date 137 cases of completely reversing type 2 diabetes and getting them uh, off medications. Um, improving CVD, so the, the lean mass hyperresponder studies with Dave Feldman, they found people on a ketogenic diet with so-called massively elevated LDL for an average of 4.7 years, actually found they had reduction in their atherosclerosis. It didn't go up, it didn't even stay the same. The trend was to improve. Um, Crohn's disease, we're seeing multiple studies with this showing that you remove carbohydrates, you remove different sorts of uh, foods and just keep meat and those sorts of things. Well, they, they just removing things, but what you keep is, is generally meat after that. Um, you're reversing this, keeping people into remission. SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, there's a case series showing that uh, carnivore diet specifically has um, uh, reversed that. Alzheimer's disease. There are studies showing that ketogen, high fat meat based ketogenic diets are a better treatment for Alzheimer's than every drug ever trialed, right? Okay, so how to make a change. I'm probably going to go through this a bit more quickly just because, um, just for time's sake. But, you know, the, the main problems is that all the money is on the side of the pharmaceutical companies and the drug, and the drug companies and the, and the food companies. And so research is coming from them, but they also have this product this, this, this product model where they have a marketing budget. And so they're pumping out a lot of money and they're getting people out there talking about it. They can pay media corporations to talk about, you know, the new Ozempic trials or something like that, whatever the new drug is of the day. Um, but they also are pushing their, their agenda into the medical schools. They're, they're helping to curate the curriculum for medical schools. They're, a lot of the professors are on boards of all these things and they have a, a, a implicit bias in what they teach medical students as well. And that gets into residency programs and is the boards. What we learn about, they dictate this. The food and drug companies dictate this. And then the continuing medical education at the different conferences that are not like this, that are, that are sponsored by, uh, they're all sponsored by big pharma and big food. And so they get to talk about like, oh, well, we don't like that speaker. He says, he talks about a ketogenic diet. We don't want that, right? And, um, but, that, but that's also why, I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of studies. Why don't doctors know about these? Well, we know about it, but because we did our own research and we looked into this, or we had a patient or ourselves who had massive health improvements because of this. And, and then we started looking into it and going, my goodness, there's thousands of studies there, but you know what? They don't have a marketing budget behind them to get this into the medical schools, to get this into the residency programs, and to get this into the conferences. We have to do these things independently, right? And they don't have... Um, and they don't have sponsored lunches at hospitals and things like that. We treat these drug reps as if they're like the research wing of our hospital or something like that. Like, oh, here, here's you know, a bunch of sandwiches and oh, look at this study. Oh, that's so great. Keeping us up to date. No, this is, this is a marketing campaign, right? This is a salesman. They're giving you a sales pitch. You know, I mean, you get, I mean, are you going to let, you know, like used car dealers come and tell you about how great, a, you know, a 1996 Corolla is, you know, I mean, it's all, oh, look at this study, how great it is. Like, yeah, okay, fine but you know, know where it's coming from, right? So this is a grassroots movement. There are doctors stepping outside the system. They're seeing this for themselves. They're seeing what actually works. They're getting really despondent with the, the system saying like, this isn't helping people. I'm just seeing get pe people getting worse and worse and worse year after year. Um, and then they come across this and they're like, okay, this actually helps people. This is why I came into medicine in the first place. And so that's growing. There's a number of doctors here that I've spoken to that are in that category. And uh, everyone who's spoken up here has been in that category as well. And we're seeing this actually helps people, right? And then patient research, people are starting to recognize that their interests are not being, um, not being uh, taken care of, right? That, that these the powers that be don't have their best interests at heart. 
And so they have to do their own research and they actually educate the doctor. So Dr. Unwin, the reason he came to a low carb approach is because he had a patient who wasn't taking uh, their diabetes medication. He said, hey, you know, what's going on? And they said, well, I haven't needed it in a year because I stopped eating carbs and everything went away. And I can't believe you never told me that a bowl of cereal had as much sugar as, you know, it's like you know, 10 teaspoons of sugar, right? And that, and that this actually mattered. Like, you, you know, I can't believe that you're even qualified to be a doctor. You didn't even know this. And he was just like, ooh. And he was like, okay, shots fired. And he said, okay, you know, when someone says, when a patient says that to you, you need to pay attention. And so he did, and so he listened, and so he, he started looking into it and realizing, wow, there's a lot here, and he's completely changed his approach. But his name was Mud for a long time, and people would, he said, people would turn their back on him, and they would, they would shout at him in meetings like this about what a, what a monster he was for doing this sort of stuff. So he had to keep records. He had to keep audits and find, like, hey, I have 137 patients that are now off diabetes medications. What are you doing? Right? And so now his name is not Mud. But that came from a patient calling him out. And, and hopefully you all are trying to educate your doctors as well because most of them are very well-meaning and want to help. But they're, just, they're, they're getting all the information from the drug companies and from the food companies, right? And they're being told that for a diabetic, hmm, it, doesn't matter. it doesn't matter how much carbs they eat. You don't need to limit carbs. Just make sure they're getting enough insulin. Well, of course, you'll say that. You're selling the damn insulin, right? But insulin doesn't have to do with just blood sugar control. As we saw, high insulin affects over a hundred different mechanisms in your body. And so the higher you bring that, the worse off your patient will be. And they've seen that when they aggressively treat blood sugar with insulin, people die. And that's why doctors say, don't want your blood sugar to be too controlled as a diabetic. You want your HbA1c to be, be you know, around six to seven. That's because of these studies that aggressively treated HbA1c with insulin and people were dying. Oh, it's because, you know, the glucose being low, they're getting hypos. No, it was because the high insulin was killing them. That's what it's from. Hey, everyone. If you need a little extra help getting started on a carnivore diet and my online resources that I have for free aren't enough for you, you can go to www.howtocarnivore.com and sign up for a 30-day carnivore challenge where you'll have online resources group support, weekly Zoom meetings, as well as the ability to chat live with myself, Simon Lewis, and the others in the challenge who can help you and support you and give you extra advice and help you along the way. So if that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you, then please go to howtocarnivore.com and sign up. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you there. So we can accelerate these things, this grassroots movement with things like this, different conferences, the Low Carb Down Under Conference the PCH conference I'll be speaking at next month, this conference, these sorts of things, these are grassroots movement that help galvanize things and help educate the educators and educate the patients who can then go and make a difference in their own communities. And we grow this process and we will eventually win this if we keep pushing because the truth will out, this does work and you can't keep this locked up forever. And then there's private funders, there's people like the bazookis who are, um, you know, they, they invented Roblox, that video game. So they're, they're very wealthy from that. Their son had bipolar. I just interviewed him on my podcast, Matt Bazuki, had a horrible case of bipolar, was, you know, had all the problems that come, came with that. And his parents were very, very worried for him. And they spoke to Professor Chris Palmer, who is at Harvard, and found this out that, hey, if you change people's diet, put them on a ketogenic, even a carnivore diet, that their schizophrenia goes away in a few months. Their bipolar goes away. Their major depression goes away. OCD, uh, ADHD, even autism can improve as well, largely to do with the benefits from the mitochondria improving, but also because you're getting rid of a lot of other toxic things that are directly harmful. And so now they're so appreciative of this. They're like, okay, more people need to know about this. So they're funding a lot of these conferences as well to educate the educators. And that will grow as well. So just some quick results from my clinic. We have over 100 patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis that we have clinically reversed that every single one, every single one that goes on a carnivore diet, their autoimmune antibodies go down to nothing as long as they stay on it. And we measure these. And it's, it's very easy to measure that. Their thyroid may not recover all the way because there is such a thing as damage done. It may not recover fully, but the antibodies go to zero and they generally come off a lot of their medications, if not all. 
um, a lot, many other autoimmune conditions. Um, Crohn's disease, also colitis, Graves' disease, lupus. Uh, we have a few patients with rheumatoid arthritis and even multiple sclerosis, and these are all improving dramatically with uh, just these dietary changes, just eating a more typically appropriate diet for human beings. <laughs> cancer. Uh, I don't treat cancer directly, but I do help people if they want to uh, investigate ketogenic metabolic therapy for cancer. It's something I've been involved with in the research side of things with Professor Thomas Seafried in America and uh, given some lectures on. Um, but we have people that are using this as an adjunct to their cancer treatment, and some of them are having absolutely remarkable results. One lady had uh, breast cancer and spinal metastases and, and mets all over her body, and in less than six months, she was completely cancer-free on uh, radiological imaging. So that's a massive, massive improvement. This lady was terminal. She said, you are going to be dead in the next few months, and now she's at least visibly cancer-free on her scans. Uh, hemochromatosis. I mean, some of you say, don't eat, <laughs> don't eat red meat because it has so much iron in it. And then we have people with hemochromatosis who have a buildup in iron and uh, actually are getting better, right? And now I have one patient that uh, hemochromatosis is rare, but uh, so I only have one patient with it at all, but he was able to actually stop needing uh, to give blood to lower his, uh, his iron levels because it's not about how much iron is coming in. It's about how you use it and how you metabolize it. That's what's important. And when your body's working properly, uh, that will work properly as well. Testosterone. Every male patient that comes in, their testosterone goes up. I have 70-year-old men who triple their testosterone and get to the level of a, of a 25-year-old. And I, I, one guy came in, he was extremely excited. And he was, he was, he was very happy. He was just teeming with energy. He just said, I just feel like a teenager again. This is great. All I want to do is work out and have sex with my wife. I'm like, great. That's good. You know, but... Um, you know, it's, you get these massive improvements in people's health. I even have professional athletes who double their testosterone. I mean, I mean, what a hack that is. You know, you're prof already a professional athlete and now your testosterone doubles. I mean, what's that going to do to your competition? And this is why a lot of professional teams here in Australia are switching to carnivore. Entire, entire teams, entire rugby teams and AFL teams are trying to switch to carnivore and they're not talking about it because they don't want the other teams to do it because this is such a hack. PCOS, as I said, you know, that just goes away. That's just insulin resistance. And um, Ehlers-Danlos, I have three patients with Ehlers-Danlos. That's, that's multi, that's a very mobile joints. They get dislocations. I have three patients. They just started eating more meat. They didn't even necessarily need to go full carnivore, but now they're getting more uh, uh, build, building blocks for collagen, I believe, and less inflammation. They're just cleaning things up. They're not having joint replacement or joint uh, dislocations anymore. It's remarkable. So we don't know why, but it's happening. Type 2 diabetes goes hand in hand with PCOS. But every single person I see, we test them for insulin resistance, test them for um, blood sugar and, and fasting insulin. They all improve, every single one across the board. I have, I have yet to see anybody go the other way. And so people say, well, if you don't eat carbohydrates for a certain amount of time, then you start getting, I've never seen that. I've never seen that. I have hundreds of patients, we check their fasting insulin and blood sugar all the time. I only see it go one direction, stabilize and stay there. And obesity. I mean, we, we probably have some of the best records um, for, for treating obesity. And um, the, the worldwide numbers, so this is worldwide for everything, everybody trying diets and things like that. Out of 100 people, only 20 will ever reach their target weight. Only five people will keep that for a year. Only one person will keep that after five years. We have very different numbers. Over 80% reach their target weight, over 26% maintain that after five years. And, um, and, and those are with more of a low carb approach. We still don't have our five year numbers for a carnivore yet, but I can tell you that every single person who stayed on that has, has maintained the weight loss. They've, no one has come off unless you come off the diet. And that's why you think of it as a way of life. This is not just a diet right? This is, a, this is a metabolic therapy. This is not a just diet to get into a, you know, your, your old you know, gym clothes from high school or something. So in, in, in summary, the natural state of, of all life is, is good health. All plants, all microbes, all animals, they're healthy. Sickness is a problem. Sickness is a disorder. It's pathological. And we just accept it as normal. So you're just getting older. You know, kids, Kids get sick. Kids get these diseases they should not have. 
elderly people get diseases they should not have and some things that we did not see in these in these uh, more primitive groups that were just eating a more natural diet until they were transitioned onto this processed garbage that we're eating too. But but even Dr. Salisbury in the 1800s, he found this long before processed foods, he found that people that were eating more plants were getting other diseases. People simply weren't like autoimmune diseases and more susceptible to tuberculosis like we saw in the in the fossil record pre and post agriculture, right? So he even figured out in the 1800s, you put people back on a red meat and water diet only, and you can reverse these things as well. I wrote a whole book on it called The Relation of Alimentation and Disease, Alimentation, Beat, and Digestion. The relationship between what you eat and the diseases you get, that these diseases are being caused by the food that you eat. And that's exactly what I argue as well. So we've lost our way in health. These are preventable diseases. These are not out of our control. Every single one of you is completely in control of the majority of things that will happen to your life and your health. 90% of the problems that we have right now are 100% preventable. Even when we were smoking at an 80% rate, uh, we did not have these diseases as well. So something added on to that to make things worse. So that's completely preventable. If these numbers can go up, they can also go down. You just have to recognize what the cause is, and then you can get rid of the effect. So as I said, sort of these, these are really from poisoning and lack of proper nutrition. I believe that's a major cause of this. Um, and if we return to our natural state, and, and we talk about you know, light and grounding, all these sorts of things, this, this is all things. We're designed to be out, we're terrestrial beings. We should be out in the sun. This is something that we've grown up with biologically, but so is eating food, so eating the right food. And so this is all important. All these things uh, roll in together. So you get back to a more natural approach to your life as much as you can living in boxes. You know, you do as best you do the best you can, you're going to get better results. And food is so fundamental because that's something you're introducing to your body. What you eat becomes your body, right? And so there's nothing more fundamental than that. And so we're getting people educated in, in groups like this and online and trying to spread this out. But it, it really comes from you guys. We can present this stuff, but it's you who have to action it in your life and show the benefits of this. And then you show your family how much better you are. They get interested. They start asking questions. You start pushing them in the direction um, of, of different information so they can look into it themselves and see if it's something that they want to employ in their own life. And then they affect others and others and others, and this just grows. And, and the reason that these channels are growing and these uh, conferences are growing like Regenerate and like Low Carb Down Under and the PHC is, is because of that, of that effect that you guys are having in your own circles. That's how this grows. You know, so, so don't, don't think that that's just a small effect. Your ripple of, of influence goes a long way. And then someone else that you influence will then be another ripple and another ripple and another ripple. And now we're having people talk about the carnivore diet, you know, on the evening news. Oh, what's this carnivore diet? We'll get the, our, our expert. Oh, it's garbage. Okay, great. You have to talk about it though, don't you? And then someone says like, well, what the hell is that about? Maybe they look into it and go like, hmm, it doesn't sound so garbage to me. Maybe they try it. I, I was on um, 60 Minutes Australia and, uh, and they, you know, they tried to sort of paint me in a bad light, but everybody in the comments were saying, it was like, you know, that meat guy is the only one that looks healthy out of everybody there. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, You know, and they also recognized I was the only one not pushing a product. You know, I just said, hey, you just eat meat. You don't need all these supplements. You don't need all these things. And, uh, and so I, I, I had a lot of people message me saying, hey, I saw that and they tried to trash you, but it made me interested and I tried it and I've never felt better in my life. So even bad press is good. But there's no such thing as good press or as bad press, right? It's, just, it's all good. You're just getting it out there. So we're already at that point that they have to talk about it. So this is working. So we just keep pushing your spheres of influence out there. And this will keep, uh, keep getting out to more and more people, and we will win this eventually. Thank you very much. Hey guys, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I had to say. If you like it, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. And if you're on YouTube, then please hit that little bell and subscribe. And that'll let you know anytime I have a new video out, which should be every week, if not more. And if you could share this with your friends, that would help me get the word out and let me know that you like what I'm doing. Thanks again, guys.